nobody repeat that. Okay, so let's talk about this quite astonishing book. As you can see, there's a few little tabs in my book here. Um, the, uh, I remember first reading about this last year when it came out in England. And I thought, gosh, that sounds really interesting. And, uh, and then a friend of mine in England called me up and said, you've got to read this book. It's just insane. <laughs> so, um, and it's just, uh, I don't know. I've, I've listened to so many interviews now with this young man. And a long one today I, from uh, Point Reyes books in, in, uh, in Point Reyes, California, uh, where Helen McDonald, you know, Vesper Flights, uh, interviewed him. Uh, and they'd never met. Uh, and so it was really fun to watch the, the two of them talk. If you, if you haven't read Helen McDonald's books, they're really quite astonishing as well. Um, but um, I'm just, I'll just state a couple of things about him that I love, or about the book that I love the most if I think about young people reading it. And uh, the three things are the absolute uh, just immersion in the outdoors and the faith that he has that the outdoors will uh, heal him and calm him. Uh, the second is how much myth he's read and how he believes so firmly in combining myth with science as, as opposed to certain people in America who believe only that science is a myth. Um, and, and then the third thing is how bluntly and beautifully he talks about his autism. I feel like I learned more about, uh, really about autism, about severe autism by reading this book than, you know, in papers that I've read and things that I've read and people who have, you know, students, kids who are autistic. I mean, I just was so impressed. Uh, and uh, Nancy had, I had already taken this out of the New York Times but there was, there's a good article from the New York Times that you can find online called He Hears the Healing Call of the Wild. Um, and he says in this thing, uh, you know, he says he never considered leaving any of the bad things out. He says, it's a diary. If there's pieces of me missing, I'm going to come off as not being human and it'll feel weird and awkward. Half of my decisions in the book wouldn't make sense if I didn't mention that I'm autistic and the feelings wouldn't unless I mentioned that I was bullied. Um, and I just, you know, he's just a, a remarkably impressive young man. Um, so I have a whole bunch of little places in the book that I, that, you know, we, I can either share or maybe not, but we'll just, uh, so that's it. I'm, I'm done talking. I had to do an hour's Zoom already today with Daniel Smith, the wonderful poet. So I've blah, blah, blah enough. You guys start blah, blah, blah. Okay. Larry, I can't get used to you being in a house. It just doesn't feel yeah, right. It's weird. <laughs> so, you know. Got a new iPad. I don't know if I can get space back. I haven't figured it out yet. Look what Kate Montgomery but, went out and took a picture of herself sitting in a park. And, you know, you, so you, you, all you, all we get is a stairway. Oh, maybe it's a stairway to heaven. Ooh, okay, cool. Okay. All right. I, I, I want to contribute uh, my, my thoughts. Um, I actually thought this was three books. Um, this was about a young adult maturing. It's also about uh, an autistic person. And it's also about, well, actually maybe a fourth, about uh, a passion for humans and nature and, and social action um, and he puts some he he manages this 14 year old manages to write about all these things in you know day by day in appropriate perspective I was just blown away well he, he does he does he, in this interview I listened to this afternoon from point race he, he said that that you know he's 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 written forever because of way of, of sort of helping himself to order his mind and and keep himself sort of calm, but uh, but then when he when he realized or when this publisher encouraged him and he realized the thing was 
instead of originally i think the book was supposed to be a kind of collection of his blog pieces mm-hmm. and then he started writing its diary and then he suddenly realized oh maybe this is the book but he said about the diary that he writes he just scribbles all over the, you know he's he has you know little notebooks everywhere and he just scribbles and then he you know puts them all together so he'll he said you know 20 notebook passages will turn out to be one page in the diary eventually you know. but i love the fact that you know that it, in, a, in a sense you know his parents and a doctor i think originally encouraged him just to keep to write every day and so we're the happy recipients now of it. and he also see the other apropos of your comment linda the other thing he said well he likes winter the best of the book because he feels like he was growing up writing the book <laughs> and he feels like winter is sort of who he is now versus spring he said with some other boy that you know he's that is no longer around <laughs> And I thought that was really, he said, he, he said he feels like he's a much better writer now. So. <laughs> what I was, what I was going to say, James, building upon um, your initial comments um, about him being autistic and how you feel that you know more about an autistic person now after reading this book. Um, I unfortunately haven't been able to finish it, um, which of course I will because I haven't gotten that far, but I'm enthralled. My nephew, who is my godson, is autistic. And we have, he's 20, 25 now, and we have a very close relationship. So it was, it was very interesting for me, as I read along in this book, I also am reading with the thought of Thomas mm-hmm. in my nephew, in my head and knowing some of the things that um, the way he expresses himself, which like you say, learning about someone who's autistic. Now, um, Thomas is not into the natural world like Dara is, but yet the, the things that he likes and loves um, I dare say, because I can hear his voice in my head if he wrote them down, if you wanted to know anything about Michael Jackson, if you wanted to know anything about the Pittsburgh Steelers, um, if you want to know about um, Thomas works at Trader Joe's, bringing in carts, kind of the all-purpose person. Um, If you want to know about the people that he sees and what he does, if, if you put it to paper, it would sound like this. Um, so I thought your comment was really spot on, um, especially when he talks, there was a place that I actually marked in the, um, on page 25 where um, he's talking about anxiety. Um, he's talking about the moon and how beautiful it is, where, where they've gone and everything he's seen. And then he says, when I'm ambushed by the anxiety army, when it comes stomping back, I'll be ready to fight, armed with the wild cries of Rathlin Island. And I read that and I went, oh, that's how I feel when I get super anxious and I try and think about, like, like last night I was out with the dog standing looking at the moon, but I, I couldn't have expressed it like that. But what he said, I went, oh, that's exactly what I feel. And somehow this young man has been able to put that down on paper. Yeah, that's great. Yes, Nancy. Um, One of the things I loved so much about, I mean, I've talked to a number of people who who were not aware of this book. Um, And I had not been until you told us, James, but one of the things I thought was so extraordinary about it and the way I describe it is that here's this, mo- one of the most beautifully written books I have ever read. I mean, his, the, the way Dara did language and the way he talked about things was just extraordinary to me. And, and 
I also thought, well, the nature, the whole nature things, and I had to keep looking up some of these um, Irish birds and things that I didn't know, which was sort of fun, actually. And I did that, by the way. But um, I also thought it was extraordinary to me how he talked about the anxiety. Mary Pat was sort of talking about the anxiety. The anxiety army, I believe, is the way he called it initially. And, but I thought that from the beginning of the book, and I guess it was maybe a year or less or so, um, from the beginning to the end of how I could see how his experiences, especially with nature and his newly supportive home and school made him much more secure and much more, um, I don't want to say normal, but I'm going to say normal just for this discussion, okay? Um, because it was like he just evolved and he grew and he, and it was, to me, it was because of the support and it was because of nature and it was because of the birds and it was, and I just found that extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Learned so much about autism. Oh, one more thing and then I'll shut up, I'm sorry. But um, so, so much of what I've read talks about the, the, the uh, autism spectrum or being on the spectrum. And he was very clear that he and his family were autistic. And I, I have not seen very much about that, at least in this country. So that's what I have. Great. Well, and, and his family is as close as otters, which is- I know, wasn't that wonderful? I, mean, I fell in love with otters. That was my favorite. I know it's just so good, but I see to me one of the the real one of the, sort of the real hero of the book is his mother. Yes. yes. Oh God. Couldn't get over. And, and she's also autistic. The mother is autistic. Right. Wow. And yet she holds everything together in this really amazing way. You know, from Christmas dinner to organizing the walks to. Wow. Um, communicating with him in very subtle ways when when he's having difficulties but knowing what to do when he's having those knowing what to do yeah what yeah. works for him or what you know what what might help him i thought that yeah. was just amazing you know, strategizing with him before things so, you know to sort of give him little kind of handholds it's what i used to say to actors you know if you just sort of get these handholds up your part you know then you won't ever panic if you know you know how you're climbing and i thought his his mother was just brilliant at that yeah. And then his two siblings, you know, right. just seemingly every bit as 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 engaged and and full of life and kind of terrifying energy. As he is. If there was ever a time that I wished I weren't an only child, <laughs> this would have been it. I mean, what a family, right? Yeah. And one can't. Um, you know, we can't generalize about mothers and say, oh, well, you know, that's what the mother is supposed to do. But um, I, um, that that comment, uh, uh, Allison, I think it was you, wasn't it? Who, who said about his mother and how wonderful she was. I watched my sister-in-law with my nephew and even at, at you, you know, even at the age of 25, because he still lives at home, she and she knows him so well that whenever an intervention needs to happen, she's there and she knows how to do it without embarrassing him. And um, it, it, it's really beautiful to watch just as in Dara's mom. Well, I guess one of the things that we can talk a lot about the autism, I have, my, one of my cousins had two daughters, twins, fraternal twins, who are on the spectrum. And she spent, in our family, she spent hours and hours and hours with these daughters, helping them uh, socialize and manage. 
And her third daughter is not, but that daughter has now got an autistic daughter. Mm. And it, it's kind of in the family, but what, what, what I think I got out of the book with understanding Dara was how somebody who's autistic needs to find a point of grounding, an organizing principle that keeps them from flailing off wherever. And in Dara's instance, it was nature, which was, I mean, look at that. What's the woman, um, the animal guy, or person, woman from Australia, whatever. Oh. Uh, yeah, Temple Grand. I mean, to find a focus that enables you to calm, it, it first of all, it helped me understand an awful lot because the other cousin, the sister of the cousin who had the autistic, is ADD. <laughs> and she didn't figure this out till she was 70. Um, and we all thought in the family, oh, Martha, you know, she's got blah, 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 whatever. She was often, it's, there's creativity. I mean, what, what I just realized is that people, a lot of autistic people are incredibly creative because that they're open to the whole world and they can't filter it. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Either Larry or Diane talk. I don't care. I don't care. Why don't you start? Why don't you just start talking? Um, I was going to read a line from the book that I liked as a retired middle school English teacher. I th this is on page 78. I think of all the technical advances humankind has made over the last hundred years, yet the way we've educated has stayed more or less the same. I would always have a few students every year who just did not function well in the traditional classroom. I tried to do non-traditional things like eventually my the desks were in a horseshoe. Four days a week, we started by writing in a journal for five minutes and I made all my students share one thing because the typical middle school classroom, you got five students who want to talk and the other 20 aren't going to talk unless you force them. But I thought he really, I taught students that I could compare him to, but he uh, wrote it so beautifully and you felt like you were inside his mind and how sad that, uh, the way he was bullied, which is a huge middle school problem. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if he or his mother never expressed it. I mean, it's a, it's a hard thing, but it was really neat when he went to the new school and everything else. And all of a sudden he was in these clubs and working with other young people. So it, it was um, a great arc and uh, if I was still teaching, this is the kind of book I would try to get a lot of young people to read because I think they would relate to it very well. Because even a quote, normal middle school kid feels like they're all alone and don't fit in and has trouble making friends. So it really was wonderful to get inside his head and whoever got him started writing I did a great job. The one thing that I will say though is I felt like I got to know his siblings and his mother. I did not feel like I got to know the father. Yes. I love, I love he, he describes his father as the odd man out because he doesn't have autism. Yeah. <laughs> really great. I know I agree. He, he's less well, he's less well delineated in the book. Yeah. That's a great comment, Larry. And, and I, I know I spent my twenties teaching high school dropouts. So, they were the kids who, you know, left middle school and then left school entirely because they just couldn't take the, the noise. You know, it was. Yeah. Diane, you had you were going to say. Yeah, something. I had a couple things I wanted to mention, and one to follow up on what Larry said was that I thought was so heartbreaking 
about, you know, when he talked initially about his school and, and the bullying and really the, the physical bullying too, you know, when he talked about being beaten up and, you know, his face in the gravel and all this stuff was just horrific. And then when he gets to the new school and after the first two weeks and he's like, you know, nothing bad has happened yet. And, and then at the end of the first term, and he says it's been the best four months of his life. Um, it just was so heartbreaking that it had been so terrible when it could have been so great, you know, and, and it was, it was so, so good to see him thriving in this new school environment. But, but one of the things I really loved about the way he talked about nature and everything was that he was so fully present in the moments when he in all of these places whether he's in the woods or on the beach or sitting and watching the the little insects in their bucket or whatever it is he's doing he's completely present in that moment and and he talked about and i i'll i'll see if i can find the quote about how he um stores you know how he's present and he's really storing away this memory for yeah. when the dark times come, you know, whether it's whether it's depression or the um, the anxiety army or whatever else. But it was just so beautiful the way he talked about that, about really um, packing away these memories, um, I thought was just gorgeous. And we all just walk through the world, not paying attention most of the time. And, you know, I mean, I think that was a very inspiring thing to start paying a little more attention yeah well and he and i thought it was fascinating that there were three or four times in the book where he paid so much attention that he didn't know that he was soaking wet or that his that he suddenly didn't hear anybody in his family and realized they kept hiking and he's here watching a pine cone or something you know and, and he's been suddenly realizes oh i've been watching for three hours apparently you know and his family's kind of so used to him just that that's just part of the process. Yeah, that was really amazing. Uh, if you, uh, you know, I don't know how many of you read uh, the, uh, uh, Kiko uh, Kawakami's, no, Miko Kawakami's novel, uh, Heaven, this year, but, uh, you know, the book about bullying, it's unbelievable. God, it's just terrifying. Uh, and, you know, and this book reiterates how, you know, what people who are bullied have to live through and sometimes almost not live through you know it's just really extraordinary mm -hmm. you know that if i can that brings me to the notion which is not particularly in this book but the notion of trying to understand what trauma is um i i, I just he he experienced trauma <laughs> How do we, he seemed I'm not sure that in this, I mean, he, he's only, he, he expresses his anxiety his freeze, Linda? about having been beaten, but I, I'm not, I don't get a sense that he is um, succumbed to PTSD or whatever, you know, so I, yeah. I, there's a resilience there that I was just blown away by. But I, I think he finds that resilience in the natural world. I mean, that's his, that's his grounding. That's, that's his thing. I was, I was really interested, Mary Pat, in what you said, because I have a autistic stepson. I mean, Tom's son, son. <laughs> his son, who's 40, right? 40. And, yeah, and he yeah. also has a, a creative, obsessive focus um, about making art about Abraham Lincoln, you know, an admirable, <laughs> admirable person to make art about. But um, I mean, I think somebody was it you, Linda, talked about it being a self, self calming, self regulating mm -hmm. kind of a mechanism, or maybe it was you, James. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's what nature does for 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 Dara. But I also think it's what nature does for all of us. I mean, it's it's the medicine that we all need. I, I love this book so much. I mean, when I was before I retired from teaching, I, I taught college students and in nature writing. Um, they, the whole semester, they had to keep a place journal. They had to pick a spot in the natural world to observe it for a semester, how things changed, 
what changed in them. And I thought, wow, if only I'd had this book, I could have said, here guys, this is what I want you to do. <laughs> you know, here's your inspiration because he's, he inhabits the natural world so fully and he's so attentive and God, his writing is just, it's exquisite. I mean, he was 14 when he wrote this. What's it going to be like when he's 40, you know, <laughs> just, or 20 for that matter. I just found Wasn't it. Really that, the thing though, that just got you that he was only 14. I, I just couldn't get over that for like the first part of the book. I just, every, I would stop reading for a little while and just go, oh my God, how can a four, I don't know any 14 year old who could do this. And ever, and every yeah. once in a while, I think, and it's like, I think, okay, I don't want to have this thought, but okay, did he really write this? Right. Yes, no, yeah. I, did somebody write it for him because just the word. Oh, I can kind of see that. Don't forget, because the, role, don't some, forget the role um, of the editor. Don't forget the role of the editor. Yeah, yeah I mean, he yeah. did, I mean, he did, he did have help with editing, you know, and he's, and he says he learned a lot from that too, mm. I think. You know, but. I was going to say my son uh, had difficulty in school. He's incredibly smart. He teaches himself all kinds of stuff, but um, he had difficulty in school. In grade school, not too bad, but middle school, some, but high school, he got picked on. I don't know the extent of any bullying, but I know it was a very difficult time for him. People are freezing. But he... Um, once uh, he got on computers and internet and typing and art and it was astounding to type to him on that like an email and what he would reply and you go to his website and it's just uh, astounding how he has a little blog and all kinds of stuff and this is a guy that hated writing you couldn't get him to do anything you know and so in some ways, uh, writing was an outlet, and obviously for the author of this book, which I have not read yet, but it's my <laughs> next to read. <laughs> he's, he's sitting in. <laughs> so. Yeah, here's, okay, I just wanted to, I wanted to read something because I think it may get people talking about part of this too. This is just something that I love because uh, I annoy the hell out of my wife because I, basically anthropomorphize uh, everything, including concrete. But uh, he's talking about walking to school after a terrible windstorm. And this paragraph, in this paragraph, he says, the ripped up human surfaces, all broken and jagged, spoke of people first, nature last. I knelt beside the trunk and stroked the bark no longer caring if all the people passing were watching me or not. I pulled some still green leaves from its branches. They were still perfect. I collected a handful of acorns from the branches and put each one into my pocket like small pieces of hope. I walked on with heaviness, but knew my blazer carried something good. And, you know, just that he would have that sense of trying to comfort the tree in, a, in an odd way and you know and then take something from the tree that was still vibrant so that he could carry that forward um, it's, it's, it's that kind of attention that's, that's really quite remarkable and I, I agree with you Larry I feel like uh, if I if I was teaching anybody under the age of 20 and over the age of 10, I try to get them to read this book uh, for all sorts of reasons. But it's also full of hope. Which, uh, That's one of the things I really loved about it, his hopefulness. I mean, even as he's involved with all these organizations, you know, protesting things about climate change and stuff, it's it's not a it's not a gloom and doom book. It's ultimately a hopeful book. And he he reminded me. I mean, he's completely different in the way he expresses things. But he reminded me a little bit of um, Robin Kimmerer and Braiding Sweetgrass because she has an ultimately hopeful vision too. I think. I think. I think she even says, "I choose hope over despair," and I, I feel like he does that too. And that's it's encouraging to read. I think you know because so much that's written about the natural world and 
climate today is 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 hard going you know mm-hmm. necessary going but hard heavy going um, and because I live with the climate activists, so <laughs> <laughs> I've OD'd on it. <laughs> Actually, James, you signed one of our um, citizens' climate lobby um, endorsements. <laughs> no, stop. <laughs> no, I just <laughs> thought I could. Okay, thank remember, you, you, were just, you were just sitting in, remember? <laughs> that was a couple of years ago. But thank <laughs> you for that. <laughs> Say that there in some cultures, I'm, I'm looking at a species. And these human beings who have or who are autistic, autistic, they're special people perceiving the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we have a tendency to uh, rationalize it. And I think, in a sense, it, it's a. It, there are other there are other kinds of special people uh, in some cultures, but I think in our culture, people who are autistic uh, and can make the bridge to the uh, enlightenment rationalistic people uh, are a special way of accessing the world and helpful to our survival. I, I must feel it's, it's a form of self self-preservation um you know if if we felt if we had all the feels burdened upon us that that dara feels when remember when he accidentally kills the grasshopper and Mm -hmm. just is devastated Mm -hmm. and and if if every day we thought about um the way some people live the conditions you know it's all the luck of where you're born you know just to have all that weight on your shoulder i don't know how we could could go on and and dara and his siblings you know are in autistic people perhaps in general i don't want to generalize but just feel feel more about certain things and and i feel like um well that's a that's really a gift it's also you know such a burden to 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 feel so much um and and then uh, I was also going to say, as, as the mother of a 13-year-old, I had to often remind myself that Tara was 14. Good, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and, and I agree with him. I thought that the, the winter chapter, oh, I loved it so much. I mean, it, it made me look forward to winter coming. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I, I thought for the same reason that, that Dara said, just, just to see how he evolved and, and how happy he, he has become. Um, you know, blossoming with with friends and and just a little maybe more self realization. And he even said something like his his sister doesn't get that yet. Um, no. but yeah, I, I I loved it and especially winter. I thought it was a fantastic, fantastic chapter. Well, and just when he was even in that in that same section that you were just talking about, he 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 makes a joke, which he really doesn't make jokes throughout, you know, it's not a book filled with a lot of humor necessarily, but he does make a joke about the very fact that he does have friends, plural, mm-hmm. not, not just friends, <laughs> in that. So that, you know, I just thought that was, that's a great, you can see his evolution, I guess, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As, as you go through the whole thing and get to winter. Yeah. So I just want to respond to the issue of his writing. I'm a middle school judge for the Southeast Wisconsin Festival of Books. And there's usually two or three out of the 20 submitted that would would blow you away. It's the, the reason, when I taught, we used to do this technique called free writing where you write for five minutes, whatever is going through your mind. And I thought that's why it was so effective. I think a lot of it was his stream of consciousness that he was able to capture. I'm guessing there was not a lot of revision for the main thoughts that he was expressing. And I think that's why he's so effective. So, you know, it's it's like the young uh, poet who spoke at Biden's inauguration. I mean, she blew people away, but she's been writing poetry for like 10 years. And uh, 
it's amazing what some young people can do. Mm-hmm. What, what was the, the, old, the, the old Tom Lehrer joke about when he, he was in his 40s or late, late 40s, early 50s when he said this, but he was talking about genius. And he said, he said it's, it's, uh, it's sobering to think, for instance, that when Mozart was my age, he'd been dead for 17 years. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, some people just get it earlier, you know. I mean, what can we do except be happy that they could share it with us? The, James, you know, where, oh, oh, go ahead, Diane. Oh, James, I was just going to ask you said you that you saw these interviews. Are, are there things on YouTube or something? Are there interviews with him? There's, there's a number of them, yeah. So if I search YouTube, I should, I, I mean, I would love to hear him speak. Yeah, he's got a very, uh, Nancy was laughing about how deep his voice is. He sounds very mature. Uh, but yeah, just type in his name. Okay. Or, or the name of the book, either one. And they'll, you know, th- there's, there's lots of them. Uh, okay. so, uh, I was going to say, sometimes, um, I know I have to remind myself that as we get older, um, I think, Kate, you get to be you get to be excused from this part of my co- of, of of my comment. Um, um, but you know, I have to remind myself. It, it's you know, we we talk about all these wonderful things that he's done, and, and certainly I have not written a book like this when I was fourteen or whatever age, and. And Nancy, you know, you said you're thinking about your 13 year old. I think I for I know I forget that if I look back to when I was Dara's age, there were things that I was doing that certainly were not this. But um, I mean, I remember I read War and Peace when I was 15. I remember that because I was trying to impress this boy that I knew who had read it. So I was like, I'm gonna read it. Now, I can't tell you that I understood what I read, but I mean, for a 15 year old, that's a pretty complicated book. Or, you know, just some of the things that I I, I did and, you know, I was in 4-H and I think of some of the leadership things I did. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not saying that it's equivalent to this, but I have to remind myself that I was capable of a lot of things when I was younger. And so if if I remember that, then maybe it helps it. um, I don't even, I know if I'm articulating this well, but it makes it easier to understand his writing this book. Does that make sense? kind of came out in the jumble, but yes, it, it totally does. And when I think back on it and I think some of the the papers and things that I wrote in college and high school, I don't think I could write today. You know what I mean? I think I was a much better writer then than you know than I could ever do now. I feel like I my brain has deteriorated since then. <laughs> But, but I know what you mean. I mean, his writing is just extraordinary and, and fabulous. Um, but I also, I agree with Larry. I don't think there probably had to be a lot of editing. I mean, it, 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 it sounds like a true voice. You know, it doesn't sound like somebody went in and, and um, you know, with a red pen and changed it. It just sounds very true to me. Great. I, yeah, I would agree with Larry too that you know there probably wasn't a lot of that the, that the street that his stream of consciousness that 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 was all there. I mean, I suspect if editing happening happened, it was refining the languages and the images, you know, to make them really sharp. Um, but I agree that you know that voice is is really there. You know, Mary Pat, I was thinking when you were talking that. Um, It seemed to me like what you were describing. I didn't read War and Peace when I was 14. Um, I did read Jane Eyre, um, but then I also read Rod Rod McEwen, you know, which thank God, you know, don't tell anybody. (laughs) 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 But I mean, part of what it seemed like you were talking about was, was, you know, at that age, our, you know, our openness and our receptivity to the world is just 
so enormous. And I mean, I don't think we ever lose that, but I mean, you know, even when I was teaching college students, it was like, I had to remind them, you know, oh, here's how you open up, you know, and be receptive to things. So, I mean, I think that's part of what's so wonderful about this book is that he's, he's, he's made a record of that time and that way of experiencing the world, you know. Um, that's hugely useful to him too. Yeah, yeah. Linda, you're, oh, you're, you're muted, Linda, you're muted. My phone rang, so I had it. Um, I do think that as we get increasingly older and socialized, there's a lot of self-censorship going on in order to survive. And so you cut out a lot of stuff that initially you were open to. Um, I mean, I, <laughs> you mentioned the books you read. In the fifth grade, the most, or sixth grade, maybe, I don't know, the most significant, I read two books that had most significant, Robert O'Rourke's The Mau Mau Uprisings in Kenya and The Dollmaker. Um, well, the Dollmaker. That they were just like totally radicalizing for me at, at age. And of course, the librarian who was a staunch Catholic with an index would call my mother and say, do you want your daughter to check out these books? You know, it's like, uh, my mother said, well, whatever. I should give you whatever. <laughs> but, but we're open, in, in, especially in those at early adolescent years, that's the growing years where you you haven't self-censored. There's so much openness and experimenting going on. And, and I think that's what I enjoy about reading him. So that's why I called it kind of a young adult maturing book is because you he is also learning about himself during that year. And it's I love the fact that it's structured by the seasons. Um, okay, oh, Mary Pat, uh, War and Peace, that's the one about Russia, right? <laughs> uh, the, um... I think so. <laughs> I thought, it, I, or was it Germany? <laughs> I don't know, I'll have to go back and check. <laughs> here's, here's another paragraph, and, and there's a moment in the middle of this paragraph that, again, is, is the lesson for anybody, for all of us, but... Uh, this is on page 194. Uh, he, said, he writes, whenever I'm high on a mountain, I make an agreement with myself to leave behind all human worries, problems, thoughts. They mustn't veil my experience of nature of this place. Learning to do this took huge effort and it doesn't always happen, but doing it lets everything sweep in. I glean every smell, sound, flutter, flicker, until it takes up all the space in my head. I, I, I love that paragraph, period. But the fact that he says learning to do it took huge effort. Mm -hmm. I think that's, the, that's, the, that's the, the part that a lot of people either don't get or don't want to take on is how hard some things are. And, but if you can do them, the prize, uh, the, the, the reward is, is, is large. Um, he also talked about how when he's up on the mountain, time stops. Mm -hmm. You know, at one point he talks about the, the um, certain walks are in time, but when you're up in the mountain, you're kind of out of time or time stops, which I thought was interesting too. Mm -hmm. um, Comments. How's the weather out there, Kate? People keep driving, walking past you. Are you so oh, you are in a park. That's right. You're in a park. Yeah, I'm in a um, like a massive park in the center of the city. Do you feel safe there? Haven't they? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh no, are you in Tokyo? Aren't you? Oh, um, I'm in Osaka. That's right, you're in Osaka. Okay. okay, good. That's better because Tokyo sounds like it's terrible. Like, yeah, know. no, it's a mess. Yeah. There was something though, I think um talking about like Dara himself, I feel like I can't really add much more to what people have already said, but I found it interesting reading this book, especially where I'm living, because I know Spring Green is like a very 
nature -y kind of place. And it's quite easy to like get out and to be able to kind of appreciate the natural world and take a step out of human society. But I've lived in major cities my whole life. And I know it doesn't look it here, but Osaka is like pretty huge. And it's just so hard to find even this. I mean, it's nature, but like I'm on a bench and it's very like manicured nature. Mm. And there's just something a bit different than, I think, probably Ireland and Wisconsin. And it makes me wonder about the kind of lessons that Dara talks about, like how we can live with the natural world. It makes me wonder to what extent that's applicable to people who live in cities and mm -hmm. what we can be doing better, I suppose. I have no idea what the answer to that is, but something I was thinking of when I was reading the book. <laughs> uh, well, I know he was asked that question that I saw today, and he, his, one of his, part of his answer was that anywhere you are, there's nature. There's insects, there's small mammals, there's the air, there's clouds, there's trees. You know, so it's so it's training yourself to observe and sensitize yourself to even you know the smallest parts of nature, um, because you know he he his the most the early part of his life was was in and near Belfast, and you know which a, you know a, a, a very kind of tough city. Uh, and so, but I do think he's, I agree, Kate, I mean, it is, but I think his, his response to you would be, uh, just look hard, you know, look hard and, and just observe when you can. And, and that's obviously one of the huge, which, you know, uh, conundrums of, of urban planning is space, you know, is the amount of space that is allotted to parks, the amount of space that's allotted if, if the, you know, smartest thing that Chicago ever did, and I don't know why, how it, why it happens, but was leaving the lakefront unbuilt in a downtown. Mm -hmm. So there's green space and access to the lake without buildings in the lake, you know, and it makes an incredible difference. It's, you know, because I lived in Manhattan, and, you know, you barely know that there's anything but little rivers of sky. Um, and it's other than Central Park, but you know, for a lot of people, schlepping to Central Park is a huge deal. So it's, um, yeah, but I think he, I was impressed by his answer to that question because he just, he's just again turning it back on us to take responsibility to, to really pay. Uh, uh, look, I, I really support what you're saying, James, because I think Kate. Sometimes we think of nature as not urban. In other words, we're, we contrast the country and the city. And therefore, we think that the country is nature. Well, it's not. There, there really isn't any difference <laughs> in a sense. Um, and I, I think he doesn't address it in this book. And maybe he will later, just like the other environmental, the young environmentalists are, um, a, as to what global life, urban life will be when, or has to be when we have to be sustainable. And, uh, you know, he hasn't, that, that doesn't dress with this, but, but his sensitivity, I, I do think it comes back to our notions of the city and the country. And those have to change, but I don't. I don't have any answers either. Yeah, Linda, I think that I mean, and our notions of what what nature is. You know, nature is the spider in your bathtub. You know, <laughs> in, in a city, I think. You know, so it can be anywhere. You know, the dust coming in your window and where it's coming from. Right. Um, right. I was teaching. I I I would give an. A, this was in connection with that place assignment that I talked about earlier. And one young woman who had grown up in a very rough section of Milwaukee, I said, well, 
do you have a garden? Is there something, you know, we were trying to find a place for her to write about. And she said, my garden is filled with broken glass. And it was really one of the most heartbreaking things I ever heard. And I said, then, then, then you need to write about the glass, you know, and what else do you see around the glass? And she wrote a beautiful essay, you know, noticing insects and leaves that would float down and land on the, on the glass. But um, I think the question you raised, Kate, is, is really profound, you know, and important for all of us. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It is. Yeah, because, because we all need to stay connected to the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Wherever we live. So, um, okay, Nancy, Nancy? Earth to Nancy. Can you, can you unmute yourself? She's mute. <laughs> I'm like, what? I'm talking. I'm answering you. <laughs> okay. You're gonna talk a so, you are now good. for something completely different. <laughs> so next month, we're going to have two events with Christy Clancy. Um, the first is going to be on August 8th at three o'clock in the afternoon at the Slowpoke um, Cabaret and Lounge. I think that's the other word, <laughs> Lounge and Cabaret. Um, and I think we're gonna have some, a special cocktail even for Christy, because this is this is the book to, to have there. It'll be fun to celebrate that. And then Christy is gonna join us on the 18th, that Wednesday, um, the following week. So August 18th, at our normal 6 p.m. to talk about shoulder season. So you probably saw James and I both um, both talked about this in the newsletters. Um, so we both loved it. It's a it's a really great coming of age story. Um, fun Wisconsin uh, connection being at um, the Playboy Club at, in Lake Geneva, and Christy is just a fantastic author and and human in general. So hopefully. Yeah. Join us for one or both events. It really beautifully uh, delineates women's friendships too. I think uh, it's just I just think it's a it's a lovely book. Um, I may sit in on, on that Sunday, the ninth or eighth. Um, we may do a kind of a, a little three way chat because she may bring a friend with her who was one of her people that she used for research, who was a former bunny at the Playboy Club. Um, but it's, uh, she's really, I think, a terrific writer and a very loving human being. And so I urge you to, I mean, you'll meet her all, you'll all meet her next month during the book club, but if you can get to the event, are you taping that event at the? I don't think so. Maybe you should invite Dolly Parton. I saw that. Ooh. Well, Dolly's always invited to anything she wants to come to. <laughs> an invitation for Dolly. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'd, well, I'd love to meet Dolly Parton. I, she's, she's amazing. She's just an amazing woman. She is an amazing person. <laughs> well, I will miss I will miss next month's shoulder season conversation because I will be communing with nature. <laughs> I'm hiking down the uh, coast of California with some friends. Oh, I love the smoke with all the smoke. Um, well, hope, well, hopefully not, because we are going to be right on the coast a lot. Of, so um, from Santa Cruz to Monterey. That's a nice hike. That's cool. so I'll make it a point to look for bugs and everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Anything else from, from anybody? You'll have to keep a diary, Mary Pat, and take some pictures. I will. Larry, welcome to Earth. Okay. Uh, see you all next time. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. This was our twelfth visit. Wow. Twelfth. This was our twelfth book club. We made it all year. Hannah, say congratulations. Yeah. Well, congratulations to all of you.